Welcome everyone to On Podcast, the On Microsoft Podcast, where we talk about Microsoft stuff on a podcast. I'm your host today, Kareem Anderson, and we have a relatively light week of news, but a week of news nonetheless. Let's get started. For this quiet week of uh, October 7th, um, we'll be starting off our opening discussion with a roundup of Windows 11 news. Uh, Microsoft's flagship operating system uh, will be a little, will be close to a year old um, coming, I guess, up in the next couple of weeks. And we also want to kind of get a temperature on how the Windows 11 update, the biggest update to the operating system, uh, is doing in the last two and a half weeks. So first up, there's news that Microsoft's new security-first approach to the rollout of Windows 11 may be hurting adoption. According to the Landsweeper survey, roughly 45% of Microsoft devices still cannot run Windows 11. Anywhere else in the world where percentage evaluations are considered, a 50% success rate is still below passing, sadly. Landsweeper, which is an IT assessment management software provider, surveyed roughly 30 million Windows devices at over 60,000 enterprise uh, businesses. Uh, that it had access to in order to compile this report. While Microsoft can point to its lofty 1.4 billion monthly Windows 10 and 11 active devices count, which it normally does, uh, to kind of mitigate the veracity of Landsweeper's report um, as simply kind of as a drop in the bucket because they don't have access to as many devices as Microsoft does, it should be noted that uh, of the machines surveyed, only 2.61 are actually running Windows 11. Even though it's off to a slow start, Landsweeper does detail in the report that the growth is still happening when compared to last year's adoption rate, which sat at around 0.52% up until about uh, six months ago, and then shot up to 1.4%, at least with the devices that they surveyed. Unfortunately, Windows 11's um, minimum requirement uh, or system requirements are still kind of affecting a good number of the 27 million Windows devices surveyed during the Landsweeper report. Uh, um, which continues to keep Windows 11 at a somewhat exclusive upgrade so far. If you're thinking about joining the uh, club and wondering how much to pay the Windows bouncers to get in, Landsweeper details where rejections, where most rejections are, at least coming uh, from during the last failed system requirements test. In this report, Landsweeper recorded that 92.9% of devices passed the RAMS test at least, while the drop-off really starts to begin with the TPM requirement check, uh, with only 64.6% of devices passing that one. And on that note, uh, Chief Strategy Officer at Landsweeper projected that at its current pace of pass or fail adoption based on the TPM report or uh, requirement, it would take Windows 11 roughly four more years for majority of devices to pass the TPM check, which ultimately translates to companies will need to invest in newer devices versus simply upgrading uh, existing workstations, like that's just the reality, like you're not gonna get um, work uh, devices that are upgrading at the same rate as just buying new ones because of that requirement. While this might be a godsend notion for those of you working on patchwork stations, you know, desktop towers from, you know, the early 2000s, it doesn't necessarily mean that you're gonna be getting a new system anytime soon because we know how frugal businesses are. So you may be running that, you know, Windows 7 desktop from 2009 for a few more years, sadly. Yes, Windows 11 has uh, moved past Windows 8 when it comes to adoption. Windows 7 appears to be still be uh, the 400 pound gorilla in the room for enterprise uh, businesses, despite it being pulled off of life support about two years ago. As a matter of fact, unless we were noted that 4.8 82% uh, of devices it scan are running an operating system that's figuratively a zombie, in, at least when it comes to support. And to scare the bejesus out of some IT guys, there are close to 1.2% of servers that are kind of in the zombie state that are unprotected and unsupported. When speaking with Microsoft, Landscape Spokesman said, quote, we know that those who can't update to Windows 11, which is most business devices right now, will continue to use Windows 10. But even if organizations are prepared to upgrade their PCs to meet the requirements of Windows 11, there are broader issues affecting adoption that are out of Microsoft's control. Global, global supply chain disruptions have changed, uh, have created chip processor shortages, while many are choosing to stick with what hardware they have at the moment due to global financial uncertainty. So, you know, everyone's kind of predicting this upcoming recession. This doesn't look good for adoption as well. To add a bit of further context to where uh, Windows 11 adoption ranks, 
Uh, the recent add duplex report, um, which has the operating system sitting around 23.1% on its survey devices, and we kind of know that add duplex has access to more devices. So, I mean, 23% in a, roughly about a year of the of the total market isn't too bad. Uh, you know, Microsoft's not doing too, too poorly, but uh, I do believe that forcing everyone to get new hardware is going to be the slowing factor, especially as we just saw the boon in uh, new hardware kind of come to an end now that we are post pandemic, I think, sort of end of, I don't know where we're at in the pandemic. You guys tell me. As part of some more Microsoft round, uh, Windows 11 roundup news, Microsoft's beginning to speed up the rollout of the Windows 11 20, uh, 2022 update. Um, with that being the backdrop, we can take a look at how the update is doing. Um, if you happen to get past the TPM uh, Windows 11 bouncer and are in the Cool Kids Club, now it's time to check and see if you are eligible for the free drinks that come with it, i.e. with the Windows 11 2022 update. Fortunately for you, Microsoft is trying to speed up the rollout of Windows 11 2022 update as a result of some of the early self-induced incompatibility issues. According to a post to the, uh, on the Windows 11 blog written earlier this week, the Windows team is, quote, entering a new phase of the rollout for Windows 11 version 22H2, and we're increasing its availability to all who check for updates on eligible Windows devices. Note that if we detect that your device might have an issue, such as application incompatibility, we had put a safeguard hold in place and not offer the update until the issue was resolved, quote. The Windows team is encouraging users to check their settings page on their online or the online compatibility website to upgrade. But they are also noting that there are about five different reasons they've identified so far that can keep your system from upgrading to uh, the new update. That include provisions packages might not work as expected with the windows might only be partially configured and out of and the out of box experience might not finish or might restart. So if they fear that that's gonna happen, you don't get it. Some install printers might only uh, allow default settings, which means some printers might not have all the features available, such as uh, color, two-sided printing, or high resolutions. They'll stop it for that. You don't get it. Compatibility issues with Intel Smart Sound technology drivers in Windows 11, i.e. Windows 11 uh, devices with the affected Intel SST driver might receive an error with the blue screen. Again, you won't get it. Copying file shortcuts using group policy preferences might not work as expected, i.e. files or shortcuts might not uh, copy or copy as uh, zero byte files when using group policy preferences on client devices. Again, you won't get it if that happens. And KB02170 might fail to install and you might receive, a, and we all know this, 0x800F0922 error which means security updates for the secure boot DBX might fail to install. And then again, you won't get it. Lastly, in our roundup for Windows 11 news, uh, Windows 11 2022 update is slowing down when copying large files. So even if you manage to get past all the requirements and, is and issue uh, on or for John to finally get into Windows 11 and get the update and you even get the uh, 2022 update uh, on top of that. That doesn't mean that it's smooth sailing from there on out. As reports of Windows 11 2022 update is slowing down machines while copying large files have begun to surface. Microsoft confirmed earlier this week that a file copy bug in the Windows 11 2022 update is indeed causing the operating system to slow down when engage, uh, engaging in large file transfers. The problem occurs when copying a multi gigabyte file from a remote location to a Windows 11 machine. The performance could degrade as much as 40%. Copying the same file on a previous version of Windows 11 does not exhibit the issue. Microsoft doesn't have a permanent fix for the issue yet, but it does clarify that uh, the issue is not a SMB code. You can experience this issue doing local file copies as well. Workaround, a workaround is offered using the robocopy or xcopy command with uh, backslash j syntax that does return your system to full performance. Microsoft will address the issue in a future update. Home. I think we're expecting uh, the features pack update uh, sometime next week, so maybe it's rolled into that. Fingers crossed. Now on to the headlines. Uh, Google's Made by Google event uh, just wrapped up uh, this yesterday, I believe. So Google held its annual Made by Google event yesterday, and by all accounts, the event landed with a whelming thud, at least in my opinion. Uh, if by design, 
Google leaked much of what was announced during the two hour during the hour long showcase, with only the Google tablet being the biggest surprise of the event. We got clear information on specs, prices, and dates for the Pixel 7 and 7 Pro that include two devices sporting this year's Google Tensor G2 chip, which is a follow up to last year's Tensor debut. The Pixel 7 and 7 Pro are refined versions of last year's model down to the screen refresh at 90 Hz and 120 Hz respectively. Each of the two devices are dropped a millimeter of height down to 6.3 and 6.7 inches and are uh, banking on super res zoom and cinematic blur features to be big enough selling points uh, for you to buy this version, uh, at least for the new camera upgrades. The Pixel 7 will cost around $599, while the Pro will come in at around $899. That's, I guess, the surprise was the price, um, and Google keeping that price. And both will be available starting next week. As for wearables, the long-awaited Pixel Watch finally made an official appearance, and by all accounts, looks just like what it did during all the leaks that we saw about a year ago. <laughs> Uh, the size seems to be the most notable thing. Uh, people who got a chance, or at least for people who got a chance uh, to get some hands-on with the uh, device itself, the one size fits all 41 millimeter watch is smaller than no, uh, the noted competitors' offerings, uh, such as Apple or Samsung. Uh, this wasn't a laundry list. There wasn't a laundry list of uh, health features that accompanied the watch during its unveiling, kind of like we got with uh, at least. Apple and its series, uh, watch series eight, but Google did say there would be deep integration with Fitbit out of the box. Um, and we'll just have to see how the Samsung Exynos processor, which is, is coming with it, uh, it's new frameless border and watch, uh, OS 3.5 kind of hold up over time. They also didn't make mention of battery life. So, and this is the first iteration of it. So we know how the first iteration of devices went with battery life. So we wish Google the best of luck with that. The Pixel Watch will start at $349.99 for the standard version and $399 for the LTE model. Lastly, there was a Pixel Tablet uh, to talk about. Well, I mean, at least mentioned because that was the extent Google talked about it very briefly uh, and didn't offer too many details. Uh, and that's because the device does not come out uh, until sometime in 2023. Uh, the details about the software specs were light. We do know that it will be rocking the same Tensor G2 processor. That the Android, uh, or I mean, that its handset brothers are kind of rocking. Uh, other than that, we the other thing we know is that it will come with Android 13, uh, obviously be upgraded to 14, probably when the time is right. It will come in two colors, off white and olive gray option, and it has a docking feature, which makes it kind of like the Google Home Nest, I believe. Uh, I don't remember the screen size, but it looks like a healthy size uh, tablet. It's telling that Google recently scrapped efforts on its Chrome OS Pixelbook in favor of its Android powered Pixel tablet. I'm not sure what the tea leaves are telling me, but I'd be a bit cautious sinking any money into this device early on. I'd say give it until December of next year before you start putting money on it. Uh, and who knows? Be able to do like Stadium, give your money back. If they don't follow through with it. Uh, other news we have EU is uh, strong army Apple into being universally compliant by enforcing a USB standard voted uh, in by the European Council, the European Parliament, and several other member nations. Apple has until 2024 to add USB-C ports to its iPhones that are sold and distributed in the EU uh, as an effort by the EU to reduce e-waste in the region. Parliament rapin rapporteur Alex Agui Saliba, I'm sure that was entirely pronounced wrong and I apologize. He said, quote, the common charger will finally become a reality in Europe. We have waited more than 10 years for these rules, but we can finally leave the current plethora of charges in the past. The future proof uh, law allows uh, for the development of innovative charging solutions in the future and will benefit everyone from frustrated consumers to our vulnerable environment. These are difficult times for politics, but we have shown that, in the, that the EU has not run out of ideas or solutions to improve the lives of millions of Europeans and inspire others parts of the world to follow a suit. Apple will have to decide if it wants to include the USB charger port for all of its mobile devices going forward, if it will just do it for the EU distribu distribution or go completely portless uh, by 2024, which could be a reality given the stubbornness and their unwillingness to integrate with the rest of the world uh, and the proclivity for eliminating ports and slots on devices. But either way, they'll have to uh, comply with the mandate by some time in 2024. 
Microsoft has officially completed the uh, glow up of its partner network and is officially launching the revamped Microsoft Cloud Partner Program this week in a private preview with a public preview scheduled for some time later this year. Aside from the name change, uh, the Microsoft Cloud uh, Partner Program will now introduce two levels of partner capabilities that include Solutions Partner Level and Expert Partner Program Level. The new CPC, or I mean the new CPP, will come with a single tier solution partners designations which will replace the legacy silver and gold uh, competencies. In an email sent to us at on Microsoft, Microsoft pitches that the, new, that the six new solution partner designations that are replacing the silver and gold competencies, such as data and AI, infrastructure, digital and app innovation, business applications, modern work, and security are all generally available to partners. Uh, with this being an initial launch, Microsoft already has plans to introduce more industry designations uh, tailored for partners who build software in retail, health, healthcare and financial services services in the future. Surprise, surprise, Microsoft is already getting criticized for its non-existent metaverse uh, vision. In a headline reading, something's missing from Microsoft's industrial metaverse approach. Uh, this is what industry analysts are saying. Based on an investor call last month with executive VP and chief commercial officer, Judson Aloff, Al, Al Hoff. again, apologies of Microsoft, wherein uh, he categorized three brand opportunities of the metaverse that are cropping up that include consumer, commercial, and industrial. When details of the three areas of opportunity, uh, Al Hoff explains, to, to simplify, I look at it in kind of three buckets. There's a the consumer metaverse, and then there'll be a monetization thing there in the consumer metaverse. Then there's commercial metaverse, where people will have more engaging ex uh, exper uh, exper ex experiential collaborations in the metaverse. And I do think that there's an opportunity to bring people from around the world with different perspectives to collaborate. But where I actually have the most uh, amount of passion in this thing I call is the industrial metaverse. And I have a real tangible, and it, and we have real tangible outcomes for driving uh, with customers today. And so think of it as combining sets of technologies and IoT capabilities where you can come in and create a sense, sensor fabric for any industrial process any manufacturing environment, and any supply chain or logis logistics scenarios. Now, this is where the criticism comes from. Bob e Evan over at Accelerate Economy noted that Olaf left out the connection Microsoft will need to make with customers through finely tuned experiences in order to get to any of these buckets. In other words, does any of this metaverse stuff actually appeal to people? What good is the proposed sustainability and energy efficiencies of the metaverse if no one is there to enjoy if no one is there or the ones that are there aren't enjoying it? Evan says, quote, I'm all for being as effective or as efficient as possible with energy usage and with reducing waste whenever, whenever or wherever possible. But those highly desired route comes need to be fused with great experiences for customers and great products and product services for for uh, and outcomes for customers. And to be honest, Evan's critique is perhaps the, among the most valid Microsoft has gotten in recent times. Right now, the metaverse is the butt of jokes and we'll need to need a truckload of enticing experiences before the brand begins to make you know, begins to become serious for people. And right now, uh, I don't see Microsoft's experiences in the metaverse being anything to write home about. So they have the work cut out for them. Windows 11 Insider dev channels get bumped to uh, 25, uh, 21, 7. And with that new update for the dev channel, we get a sneak peek at a new video call experience. Begun the widget wars have, is what I titled this one. Earlier this week, the Windows team rolled out a new insider dev channel. Like I said, it was uh, 25, 21, seven, and it carries some new features uh, around third-party widgets on local machines. According to the developer blog, developers with package 132S will be able to create and test third-party widgets locally if the machine is running in developer mode under settings, privacy, and set security, and for developers. Developers will also need to be on the, uh, the latest insider preview build from the dev channel to get the necessary update for the widgets board, versions 521.20060.1205.0 or higher. For more information on the widgets, including prerequisites, uh, you can please see their design uh, widget doc and the widgets dev doc. Where to get those? I believe we have them on our site. So if you go to the post, you can follow that there and they'll take you right to where you need to go. 
The other new feature in the build is a preview of a new video chat experience in Windows 11 that involves opening the chat from the taskbar. The focus will be on you with a preview of you and your own video and the various ways you can connect with other people. Uh, Microsoft claims that it'll be easier than ever to immediately start a video call with those who are using Windows Team for personal. Oh, six of us? For anyone using it for business, you can still drag someone into your weird Teams fantasy um, by sending uh, out a link via email, text message, or chat. Next up, we have some rumors about Halo Infinite possibly switching to Unreal Engine. Rumors about a Battle Royale light version of Halo are resurfacing following a confluence of incidents and recent suggestions that point to a possible future where some portion of the game could run on Unreal Engine. Much of this news is gathered by Jess Corden over at Windows Central alongside YouTuber Sean W, who are reading the tea leaves about founder Bonnie Ross leaving, as well as the architect of the troublesome slip space engine itself for the game, David Berger, who stepped down around the same time she left. Combine this info with the fact that developers and the franchise have histori historically complained about slip space as a rendering engine and the pace of its development when using it, one could make the argument that a break from slip space engine uh, shouldn't be out of the question, especially uh, after the relative success of Microsoft switching from eight Edge HTML to Chromium. I mean, uh, they have uh, a roadmap on how to kind of pivot on a dime and go in an entirely different direction. Microsoft began testing Unreal Engine with several of its studio uh, studios already that include Undead Labs, Obsidian Entertainment, and Exile Entertainment in the initiative. So moving forward, uh, or at least moving some parts of Halo franchise over to Unreal, should, you know, makes a little bit of sense. They have some experience with it. Now, to kind of put the cherry on top and make it a little more solidified, uh, Microsoft partners uh, Certain Affinity is said to be working on some Battle Royale light version of the game, and they are already known to be using Unreal Engine for a lot of their development. So while the main Halo Infinite game looks to probably stick with Slip Space because it's, you know, season three and four, I believe, have already been kind of developed out and built on that for now. That doesn't mean that a seasoned battle royale game with a quicker feature release cycle akin to Fortnite couldn't soon be a reality thanks to using Unreal Engine in the future. And if, again, we kind of read into Bonnie Ross leaving, aside from her personal uh, dealings that she has to go take care of, and um, Subspace uh, Architect also stepping down, this could be the sort of clean-ish break to start moving Halo to something a little bit faster. Next up, we have UK regulatory body sets a March 2023 deadline for Activision Blizzard deal, at least the review of it. Uh, with the UK going back to back in to reevaluate Microsoft's proposed Acti uh, Activision deal, they were now getting a deadline for the completion of their secondary investigation. By March 1st, 2023, the CMA would like to have its investigation concluded on the six, $68 billion deal. The CMA is different than the EU in general, uh, and the EU, uh, would like to have its own investigation wrapped up by November 8th before it starts even contemplating a secondary round of investigations. We'll see how that works out for Microsoft. Now, Microsoft might be trying to flank some of this uh, deadline news by releasing a new web page detailing all the proposed benefits of its Activision acquisition. Microsoft's new Our Vision for Gaming, More Choices and More Games and more uh, for More People Everywhere. It's kind of a bit on the nose as a title. Extols the acquisition's virtues uh, that include accessibility of games uh, on several different types of devices, including phones, tablets, and consoles, and PCs. A greater flexibility in payments for game developers is another kind of plus saying, hey, let it go through so we can give developer game developers more revenue streams. And they also quote greater competition in the traditional gaming uh, sector. Somehow, that part was kind of vague. They didn't really go into details about that. I'm sure Sony would argue vehemently about it. And in fact, they actually are. Uh, regardless, Microsoft will have the next five months to convince the CMA that an approval on this deal is in the best interest for the industry and not just Microsoft. So good luck, Microsoft. Last up, we have the Surface Duo reportedly getting set to get Android 12L within the next few weeks. Um, Microsoft has slowly, very slowly, and sort of quietly, been winning back some uh, reviewers, some uh, users on YouTube um, who have gotten part or at least joined part of the price wars on eBay, have been getting devices for as low as $250 for the first or, or for the original deal and $600 for the deal too, depending on how much damage you can tolerate on a device. 
uh, and pair these up with some timely updates that have vastly improved the performance on both devices, people are starting to come around to Microsoft's vision of a, a dual screen device. Now, Zach Bowden over at Windows Central is saying that uh, Android 12L could be coming to both handsets and bringing actual Windows 11 inspired designs and features to the phone. Of note, Fluent Elements could be coming to the notification shade, uh, which is said to be taking a visual uh, to be taking visual inspiration from the Windows 11 Quick Settings menu. So, if you're listening to this and you're on your PC, quickly go down to the Quick Settings menu, pull it up in the bottom part of your taskbar. That's what our notification shade might look like. Uh, as well as the overall launcher, which is roughly the operating system on the device, uh, getting more blurred effects throughout the experience, kind of like we have uh, the acrylic and other things from Windows 11, they will be coming over to that launcher. We haven't seen any screenshots of this, but Zach seems pretty confident that it'll be coming out in the next few weeks or so. The update is uh, also reported featuring uh, a new dual connect mode for enterprise customers, which is designed to provide them with uh, continual style experiences uh, where you, you can link up uh, your handset to a larger display and be empower uh, Windows 365 cloud PC services through it. It's not clear how this feature will work or if it'll be like Continuum, but or Dex, I suppose, is the closest uh, analogy. That's it for the news uh, this week. Um, again, as always, I'd like to thank you guys for spending some time with me this weekend. And if you're into more than just listening to me go over the news, you can read all the details of all these stories uh, over at Microsoft.com. Uh, if you if you just want to collect a bunch of headlines like they're Pokemon and you don't have time to dig into any of the stories, you can go over to uh, our Twitter handle on Microsoft and get all of the headlines there as well. Uh, we, I would also encourage you to follow us on our Microsoft.com for more headlines, editorials, features, how tos, uh, which again are gaining massive traction because they've been super helpful for a lot of people, as well as my hardware reviews, uh, some giveaways when we occasionally have those. Uh, I'm going to switch up the goodbye this week uh, where it makes a little more sense and keep it very simple. Enjoy your tech. Enjoy your day. Goodbye.